Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, groundbreaking drummer and founding member of the rock band Tesla, Troy Lakenna. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another episode of The Rich Redmond Show coming to you from two time zones. I'm in sunny Los Angeles. Yeah, it's still sunny and 70. My co-host, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy, yeah. voiceovers.com. We got a really special guest today. But first, I want to catch up with you, Jim. Jim, what's going yes. on, man? How's Nashville? It's sunny and 70 where you are. Yeah. It's rainy and 56 where we are. Or sorry, hey. 69. Yeah. No. 69. <laughs> You're nuts. I ran, I ran up this. I, I had the Iron Maiden song run to the hills in my in my head today. And I don't even know if this is a good thing or not. It's a byproduct of being on social media for 15 years and living our life through that dang thing. But I'm doing my run and I'm running quickly up Doheny up to where Gil Turner's is. And I guess we'll, our guest today will know all about this because I wanted to go up on Sunset and see if they had any posts or memorials to Eddie Van Halen, which they did. And what's going through my head was like, I'm taking a video of myself running up the hills and thinking, I I'll put this to the Iron Maiden song, Run to the Hills. <laughs> All the gallops, right? <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I didn't post it because I, did, I just felt it just felt cheesy, but it went through my head. That is such a side effect of living our life through this matrix. Did it, did it make you want to at least throw your leg up on a boulder like Bruce Dickinson threw his leg up on a uh, monitor and just like, run to the <laughs> Now, now, right? I th now, now, today's guest, I'm just real, really excited about. And, you know, if, you, if people have been listening to this show for like 80, 85 episodes, they're going to be like, Rich, you're excited about all your guests. But right. every day just keeps, is like a gift. Now, this young man a hero of mine growing up and it's so amazing when your heroes can become your friends and your colleagues and they can send you inappropriate texts at any hour of the day and that is this gentleman he's a seasoned rock and roll drummer and a founding member of the american classic rock band tesla our friend troy laquetta how are you buddy <laughs> That's quite an intro, Rich. I'm fantastic, man. I'm doing great. And oh, that was Jim, great. give him some more applause, buddy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, right back to you, man. You deserve every one of those those claps, man. So we were catching up off camera um, about what's going on where you are. You're in uh, a suburb of Nashville, Music City, USA. And of course, I think you've built 20 or 25 recording studios with the sweat of your brow over the years. You're a man of many talents. And so if people aren't watching this, if they're just listening, Troy is joining us from his recording studio in Music City, USA. I am. Thank you for having me. Happy yeah, day. man. How did you, you, you learn all that Greg, stuff? Greg Glazer. I'm sorry? That was two questions buy? at the same time. I know. It's like we're fighting for airtime. <laughs> uh, do you buy through Greg Glazer at Guitar I, Center? I do not. I don't know. Do not. He's a good guy to know because he's like, he's like upper crust. Um, I wouldn't call it upper crust, but he's like the upper echelon. He's upper management. Yeah. Wait a minute. Rich, of Guitar I Center. I, I no, I bought um, my SPDX. Is that how you say it? I called you, and I think you introduced me to him, and I went down and I got that. I, be, I believe it was Greg, but that so was got, probably, probably the last time I've been there. Yeah, you got your. You're getting preferential treatment there, and now instead of being at Guitar Center right there on Thompson Lane, they've got uh, GC Pro as its own little office, which is right next to Treasure Isle Studios, where we record all the Aldine records. And I was just there, like. Two weeks ago, and every time I pull my car up, I can look through the window of the other building, and there's Greg just <laughs> doing yeah, his thing, I man. You, I'm sure you've done a lot of business there with, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, man. No, I have. No, you're right. I have. I've had a lot of studios over the years, and it started back in probably 1991, I think. I had my first Jade console. I was in Hayward, California, and uh, I built my first a real recording studio and in that studio was called TML studios in Hayward, California. And I had a lot of people come through that place. I had, um, 
back then, I remember I had Testament in there for a couple oh. records. We just talked was, to Johnny T yesterday. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, Johnny, what a what a great guy, great player. Yeah. But uh, yeah, well, I had a lot of lot lot of lot of people come through there. Third Eye Blind, and it was amazing. And then fast forward, I had another place in Hayward, and I had you know I had Tower of Power, Great Ken, and just wonderful, amazing artists coming through there, and it was awesome. Wow. Conspiracy. Remember that? Greg Kin Conspiracy? We recorded, I should say, um, Richie Corsell, the engineer that I was working with, that he was doing a lot of work out of my studio. They did the uh, the re-records for all his hits, and they record re-recorded all those hits, and I'd walk in the studio, and I'd be listening, and they sounded like Exactly. I mean, they freaking nailed it, man. Yeah. And I was like, my goodness, you know, that's what what you do after you sell your masters. <laughs> well, the, I mean, I mean, the, the funny thing is, is that, you know, and now in, uh, you're way ahead of the game because in today's music business, you really kind of have to multitask and to be not a jack of all trades, master of none, but a jack of all trades, master of all. And there's so many things you could dip your, your toe into. So you've been a studio owner, you're, you engineer records, you produce records, you've song written with a lot of the people that co co-written songs with a lot of the people you work with. You have been a session drummer and most people would be happy with any one of those things, but to top it all off to be in a band for 35 years that is strong and creative and relevant. I mean, I saw you guys last year at the Ryman. It was packed. You know, uh, thank you. Um, it's been an amazing ride, man. I mean, to think back, you know, back when the rep, we, we hit the road in 87 with David Lee Roth. And, um, and to think, you know, forward think it through, I would have never, I mean, at the time, you know, when you're young, you want to make a record and record. And, you know, it started a little earlier than that for me with the Eric Martin situation. But um, I never, I never seen this coming 35 years. Later. And I'll tell you what, it's better than ever. And, and the band is still doing very, very well, as you saw. You yeah, know, they're putting so. butts and seats. I mean, that's what everybody wants. You want to put butts and seats. Yeah. You want to show your audience a good time. It was obviously uh, so many true believers were there. They know all the words to all your songs. Of course, I was there with your brother, Denny. And so I got some preferential treatment. That was fun. Um, but it was just just great and just really – so take us back even further. We can talk about that because I know that Jim, as um, kind of like a serial entrepreneur, he wants to probably talk about the band as a corporation, which I think a lot of people are, are very curious about, the, like how a band actually works. But go back – you're a Northern California boy, right? I mean, you lived in Los Angeles. And then take us through that lineage with Eric – I'm a huge Eric Martin fan. If For the folks that are too young, Eric Martin was the – front man of a band called Mr. Big and still is. But before that, take us back. Well, before that, so it was probably about 1980 that I think I got with them. And no matter of fact, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, because uh, we, we did the record. My, my son was born in 82. Nice. And that's when we, we recorded the first record. But in the Bay Area, there was a great music scene back in the day. And we used to play all the clubs. And there was a thing called the Bay Area Music Awards, the BAMI Awards. Yeah. And that would happen. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Sure. But, but back in the day, you know, they would have it at the Civic Center. And you had Eddie Money, Santana, all the greats, Journey. You know, I mean, it was, it was a killer with Huey Lewis, killer music scene, Greg Ken. And we were with Night Ranger. We were pretty much neck and neck. It was Night Ranger and the Eric Martin band. And we got picked up by a guy named Kirby Herbert who managed Journey. Oh yeah. And, and oh, that damn. was, that, this was, I mean, this was my first real break, you know, I mean, my story on a personal level even goes back before that. I was 17 years old. I'm going to retract just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, go take us back. Take us back. I'm going I'm to take you back to my first real musical experience was 1977. Yes. You know, when the dinosaurs roam, Rich, I hear that all the That's time. That's right. When I was uh, learning how to play drums and the dinosaurs roam the earth. Uh, so, uh, but as, as it would, I was 17. Uh, I went to Memphis and... I didn't have, uh, I had my Gretches back then and I took them with me to Memphis and I was out there for about six months and I was playing with a group of guys. We weren't playing a lot of gigs because all the, all the bands that I was in growing up, Rich, were original bands. I didn't do the top 40 thing. I didn't do cover bands. Never did it. I never did. Until you never had to load your drums into uh, a free beer and wings place and, have, and play Brown Eyed Girl. 
I never did that. That's incredible. Oh but I graduated. I'm doing it now. I did it yesterday. I and to say, you, you, should, <laughs> you should probably get out there and do it. I've got, I've got like a classic rock band I'm playing in. I've got the Heartland band I'm playing in. I just joined an Eddie Van Halen. Tri- I'm not an Eddie Van Halen. The John uh, Led Zeppelin tribute. We'll talk about that later. Where are you but, guys going to play in Nashville? Where are you, like, hey, it's all about accountability. I got to show up. You yeah. know my trip. It's Troy shows up. That's it, man. So the whole thing with that is not to go down this rabbit trail, and I'm going to back up here. But... Um, <laughs> The, 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 the truth of the matter is I do that. So I have to learn some songs and I could, you know, learn some more music. I mean, you know, I got to, I mean, I was, I was up practicing. I was stealing all kinds of stuff from Tishy this morning. Keep Brian, it sharp. Was, yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm watching this stuff that's out there and you know, I'm just, I'm trying to stay up on my game, but back in 1977, Greg Morrow was working at strings and things in Memphis, Tennessee. Oh my I'm God. seven. I'm 17 years old. I used to go into strings and things, and he was behind the counter. And wow. I remember That's looking nice. at. I couldn't afford any drums, and I'm, you know, um, it, it, it was an amazing time. But that was my intro to my life because since I was 15, I mean, I, I mean, I've always worked. I, I'm, I was the kid that had three paper outs, bought my first drum set. I, at 15, I'm working in, you know, um, uh, not a car wash. Um, a gas station and mm-hmm. I would take jobs and whatever I had to work and make some money. Yeah. Uh, and I was just trying to fund myself. And, and unfortunately I didn't graduate and I wasn't going to graduate. I was thinking that's where choice shows up comes from making bad choices. Right. <laughs> so I wasn't going to graduate my senior year. So I had an opportunity to go play, man. And I took it and I don't regret that at all. It was wonderful, but I ended up meeting up with Greg, which, you know, through all of that, you know, over the years, you know, he'd come out and I'd get to see him and I got to go to his place in Memphis when he lived there back in the Yeah, day. so for the listeners, Greg Morrow is one of the top recording drummers in Nashville for the last 20 years. We had him on. Um, we did have him on and I even yeah. wrote an article on him for Modern Drummer Magazine. He's like, yeah. who's going to read this? I said, everyone. <laughs> beautiful guy, beautiful player, uh, much like yourself. Oh, and um, anyway, so from 17 to... That was 77 to 1980. I was playing a lot of clubs, but they were all original bands, like I said. And I had been through a few different incarnations, and we were playing everything, you know, a lot of Queen, a lot of Deep Purple, that kind of stuff back in the day. That was what was happening, you know, maybe some Ozzy. And then, um, you know, those those were original bands, but those would be some of the choice covers we would choose from. You know, there yeah. were, you have to have a few, but never the cover cover band. I never did that, but I had a few covers I would play. Yeah. So you fast forward, and now Eric Martin, I was kind of keeping my eye on them because they wanted me to join them. I joined them for one day, uh, and then my band, I was so loyal, they called me back. and like, hey, what's going on? You're quitting us? I'm like, eh, I'll come back home. You know, I went back to them, and then, but then after – keeping my eye on Eric and what they were doing. They signed with Herbie and they were all over the TV. They were playing day on the greens, opening big festival dates. And I was yeah. watching them. They hadn't made a record at the time. And I knew that was common and they started auditioning drummers. So I went in and I was, I, I had the, I think it was February 22nd. I think it was on a Tuesday. I'd have to go back and check. I have a cassette from my, that week I was with them, my very first audition tape and I got the gig. Yeah. And I, I didn't play with Eric until Saturday night because they had two gigs at the Lonesome Cowboy in Modesto, California. Yeah. And I joined on a Tuesday and then I did Friday and Saturday night with them. And I think we did two sets, about 25 songs. And, you know, I kind of, I knew a lot of the stuff cause I was paying attention, you know, to what was going on there, but that was my break. And shortly after that, you know, we got signed to Electra records and, um, and then we had an opportunity to go, uh, you know, this is kind of a crazy story. My wife was pregnant with my son. Now we're going to record the first record. We're going to be in Fantasy Studios, Berkeley, California, our home town. I'm like, okay, cool. Everything's great. It's fine. No. Last minute, guess what? Kevin Elson, producer, engineer, Journey. Rodney Mills, 38 Special, Skinner. Wow. Dorville, Georgia. We go to Studio One in Dorville, Georgia to record. Band picks up and splits, leaves me home while my wife's pregnant and waiting for my son to be born. Uh, Not happening. They're on the phone like, hey, you got to get here. And I'm like. Well, that's a tough choice. <laughs> I mean, it's a tough position. Yeah, Easy yeah, choice, I, but tough position to be in. I, I'm going to tell you something, Rich. It's I, I, I tell this story uh, because it's kind of like, you know, you don't do what we do without sacrifice. 
and it was the greatest sacrifice for me. I had to go, and I'm like, man, I got to get my tracks done. And 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 they were, I knew they were going to induce labor because she was getting to that point. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, man, he was born on the 14th, and I got home on the 16th. Ah. Oh. Oh, wow. That's, that's not bad. I mean, my dad, I was born when my dad was in a submarine in the Loch Ness. And of course, he, he tells the story and I say, did you see the monster? Dad? <laughs> did you see the Loch Ness monster? Is it just the one child or did you have more? Uh, it, no, we had just the one. And, um, right. you know, but, uh, you know, that was, I was just sharing with the, the youngster, um, like, you know, this is a business of sacrifices when it comes to family. Unfortunately, this business doesn't cater families. Just yeah. doesn't do it. It is what it is, Jim. Uh, you have children. I have three. I've so I've seen all three of their births. You didn't miss much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you go into the room and do the peekaboo <laughs> with the? No, uh, no. The, we, we, the sonogram was as far as we got. You know. Yeah, but uh, Jim, did you go and see the the stuff, the dirty business? Oh yeah, I was there. I was, I was like, able to, you know, like at that angle, or did the you? The doctor stay pretty up? much uh, my, for my daughter, my last daughter. He pretty much handed her to me. I'm like, nah, you take her back, clean her up first. Yeah, clean her up first. That's <laughs> with the schmutz on my hands hey, now. It's hey, like, Rich, could you get more specific? <laughs> <laughs> I think if I was doing it, I would want to stay up by the mother's head. I don't want to ruin the experience. Yeah. That I, yeah. you but, know, I probably with you, brother. I get it. Yeah. The first time you go through it, you think that. Then, you know, 10, 12, 15 hours into it, you're like, you know, the nurse is sitting there looking at you. She's like, oh, I see the baby's head. You want to come around and see? I got, and at that point, I'm like, yeah, I would. Yeah. And I peered in and I was like, there she is. Cool. Wow. What an amazing was, experience. You know, Nature know, is know. amazing. Wow. Yeah. It is. So She's this happens. Here. That's your thing. That's your first break into the business. And you're you're getting your rock chops, you're you know broken in. It was uh, you know it was a great couple few years. You know we went out, we toured with Journey on Frontiers. Yeah. We were in Hawaii for uh, five sold out nights at the Blaisdell Center, which was the original. Wow, that was eighty uh, three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was eighty three because eighty four we broke up. Um, but, it, you know, it was amazing. I mean, we used to rehearse at a Journey Warehouse. So, I mean, I'd always, I'd see Steve. He came by one of our rehearsals, and I went to his house and spent an evening with him. His wife was out of town, and I was young. And he liked the record, and he, he actually lent me one of his sonar kits. I went back in and had to do a few tracks. Uh, and I used my Gretches. Well, what happened, we recorded the record. Electra uh, had, was doing a changeover, and it was, um, they were closing down the L.A. office. So, um, Max Ann Satorius, who signed us, um, she was let go when they shut down the office. So now we're New York, and guess what? You know, in comes um, Tom Worman. Does that name ring a bell? No, but it, it pro- producer Motley, Chief Trick. Gotcha. Right. So check this out. He gets in there, and uh, he's we got our record ready to go. It's done. But he decides he wants to come in. We meet with him, and he wants to re-record the record. And we're like, man, the record's done. We don't. We were happy with the record. So anyway, long story short, is we did. He gave us two songs to record that he mm-hmm. wanted us to go back and record. And that's when I took Steve's drums with me. I remember I borrowed his babingas, um, and I took them with me, and uh, and recorded those songs. Uh, and that was very generous and it, it, you know, I'm young, you know, and it's weird. So when we got, I mean, you're like board, a teenager, you're in your early twenties. Well, I was 23. Yeah. You know? I mean, we did American bands and we did some cool stuff, but the journey thing was really cool. We went out with ZZ Top on some of the eliminator dates, you know, I mean, it was a, it was, it was just enough to get, get your feet wet and want that. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and, uh, you know, Steve would sit behind me. This is a true story. He would sit behind me. That's not intimidating. And, yeah. Well, you know, it was an interesting thing. I mean, he... When We're we talking got about Steve record, Smith, the original yeah. drummer, uh, after Ansley Dunbar. Right, you know. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I seen Steve when he was with Ronnie Montrose at the old Waldorf, uh, when, right after he did the John LaPonte thing. So I was there when all these, tra- these things were transpiring. I was watching it happen. You know, even along with Steve Perry coming in the band. That's Yeah, because I go back with uh, Of a Lifetime with Ainsley. Wow. Yeah. You know, the Metallica, I think owns that warehouse that you guys rehearsed in. They bought it from journey in San Francisco. Yeah. They own it now. Cause I just watched the Howard show and he had Metallica on and they broadcast live from that warehouse that they own. Is that the warehouse that they filmed um, separate ways outside of? 
Probably. You know, uh, that with I, the keyboards you know, on the wall. Yeah. Right, I don't remember that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but those were, you know, when you're that young and you're just getting your first experience with your first record and you're, you know, you're going out and you're doing some dates and you're tour. I mean, it looked like we were really going to happen, you know? Um, but unfortunately, you know, um, with the collapse of the company and no support, you know, even with the dates that we did and the things that we had done, it just, um, it, it, it didn't happen, you know? And, and Steve, I don't know if he knew something. This is a trip because during, we had one night, he had, he had a limo. He goes, come on, uh, we're going to go out. We went out to this club and, you know, it was funny. He sat in with the band, you know, they, of course it's Steve Smith and they know he's there. So, Hey, will you sit in and play a song or two? He sat in and played the whole freaking set. I yeah. mean, he, he didn't even get up. He just stayed there for we like did that. A lot in the early days with Al Dean, where you go to a club and be like, let's go, let's go play, man. You just stay up there all night. Well, it was, you know, Steve sitting in with the, the cover band. It was Heck cool, yeah. man. But later, you know, he said to me, uh, he goes, you know, he goes, Hey Troy, he goes, I, I, I got a gig for you. And I'm like, a gig for me he's yeah i mean he goes i really i think you should check this out and i'm like well what are you talking about because i'm out here with journey <laughs> with eric martin with a record and i'm all excited you know and i'm young and he's going yeah he goes brian adams i'm like brian adams what are you talking about he goes i just left there with brian he goes i think you'd be perfect for it did this he record perfect. heaven that and was that That's the time right. okay. exactly what happened and i just yeah well, you know, the thing, I just told him, I said, look, Steve, I go, man, thank you. But if, I'm going to tell you why I wouldn't have gotten that. I didn't believe it. I didn't have it here. I might've been, I might've been, a, Frankie LaRocca was the drummer who I loved. He did a record called Temptation with John Waite. Frankie knew, LaRocca is an unspoken hero of rock I, drumming. Absolutely. And you know what? I didn't believe that I was the guy. But yeah. the back, but it's amazing how people see you and what he saw in me. I never saw it within myself. Right. And, and those things kind of happened to me. And, you know, that's part of my story and the things that I didn't see. Um, I just didn't believe it, you know. So I couldn't have done it for those reasons alone. But And, and I stayed in a safe place. And I, and I didn't see the, you know, the demise of Eric. You know, I mean, we basically, right after that, you know, we ended up taking a meeting with Herbie in his office. And this was another lightning moment for me because here's the band in there. They're not going to pick up the second record option and the band's breaking up and we're all in there. And I knew Herbie was taking Eric solo. I knew that was going to happen, mm -hmm. but I tell you what, man, I was driving across the Bay bridge, Rich. And I had this, I just felt like I was happy. I didn't even know why the band just broke up. I lost my, and I'm happy driving home. Didn't know what it was about. I went back to Nocturne. I started working, which is, Nightmare Productions in Nocturne, where they built stages. They used to have a company in that warehouse, the front of the warehouse, the Journey Warehouse. They had a wood shop, metal shop, and I worked there. Wow. And I used to, I, I built uh, part of the Rod Stewart barricade along with uh, the decking for this motel stage that went up. Uh, if you ever see that stage, I did all the decking on that thing. But I had a job and I was working, you know, when the Eric Martin band broke up in, in at that time. You know, uh, and that's when I got a phone call from a guy named Dwayne Hitchings, who you probably know. Yeah, of course. Dwayne Hitchings was the producer for City Kid Tesla, and he called me from Eddie Money's house. And we were out doing some dates with Eddie, and uh, I lived in San Leandro, 15 minutes down the road. And he called me and he said, hey, I want to come play you a demo of a band that we would, I want you to check out that I'm producing. And uh, so he came over two songs, one called Rock City and Restless Hearts. It had a drum machine. And I just remember hearing Jeff's voice. And I go, and I was really thinking that he had a really unique sound, you know. Uh, and I just, and coming off, and, and he said to me, another game changer for me was, Gary Ferguson was the drummer who did No Control Eddie Money record. And when we were out with Eddie, Gary was the drummer and I got to be friends with, he got me my first stick deal with Dean Markley at the time. The, the and, no uh, control record. What what was that? Was that like uh, "Be My Baby" and all that on the doom, 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 you know, with uh, Ronnie I'll, Spector on there and all that? I don't, or, I don't know if that came after, but or uh, was it the one with like sh 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 shaking and all that yeah, stuff on? Yes, it? yes, that's the one. And Gary yeah. Malibur played Malibar. on two Malibar. ticket. Gary Malibur played on two tickets to paradise, right? And like Scott, baby, hold on. 
but yeah, all that. He lives out in Thousand Oaks. So I'm gonna, I got I gotta talk to him. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. gotta have him. Great play. But I got friends, so I, I become friends with Gary. Yeah, uh, Ferguson, and I knew. I don't know what happened, but when when Dwayne came to the house, he said to me, he goes, "Hey, man, if you're not interested in this, Eddie was asking about you," and I'm like, I already knew kind of what that was kind of paying and I, and the only thing it was kind of like oh that sounds pretty interesting but i'm like i don't want to be in a band i want to be in a band I want to you're, you're a band guy I, I i just man i was like man if i could be in a band and i thought i'm gonna go check this thing out you know and that was uh you know that was a game changer because yeah. Higher gun versus being in a band, and so Dwayne Hitchings is 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 actually he, responsible for yeah the, the, he's your the reason, Tesla. He, wow, he's the reason I'm in Tesla. Now, now I saw Dwayne maybe about a decade ago in Nashville, if not longer, because we got on each other's radar through MySpace, and then I was playing with that wacky cartoon band where we dressed up as nerds, the Spasmatics, and he came out to see one of the shows. I've totally lost track with him. Is is he okay? Is he in that He's school? okay. Yeah. He, he's, uh, he's, uh, you know, the funny thing is, is I was at a Halloween party last year uh, yeah. and, he, and he was there and we talked. And Great. Out. Yeah, he's got a gal. He seemed like he's happy and doing well. Um, but yeah, he's the reason I ended up with the band, you know, and, uh, it, I, and you know, I'm just so thankful. You know, you fast forward through all these years and, and you know, the, I mean, I'm, I'm, the fact that we're still together 35 years later and still I have mean, a career, wow. which is ridiculous. I mean, in of itself. So, uh, and I remember back um, many, many years ago, Aronoff was with John Fogarty and he came through town and uh, he invited me down to, no, where was it? Shoreline Amphitheater. And uh, I went down there and he was, and then, and, and I remember him telling me that night, he was going, man, he was so envious that I was in a band. Yeah. yeah. He goes, man, the guy's the one thing I wanted to do. I go, man, you know, I go, I go, look at the best thing that's happened to you. I mean, come on, face it. I don't, this is, I got a crazy story for you. I mean, I, I know we're kind of jumping all over the place, but speaking of Kenny, I, I don't think I've never really gotten this out there. I, I, I'm going to put it out there now. Cause I can't, I think I know this story. Cause I think you told me at Sam and Zoe's coffee house about eight years ago, drum that's roll. Cool. Yeah, and I don't know if, if we want to share it or not. We can, you know. Um, I, I was actually going to talk to Kenny about it. And uh, <laughs> I, was, I mean, I mean, if if you think Kenny's going to be comfortable with it, and then everyone's going to be comfortable with it. Well, you know, I, I was just going to remind him and say, hey, you know, how do you remember? It? The Rich Redman Show. We'll be right back. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. Well, let me point something out real quick, though. Because uh, th it's one thing that you said that really stood out to me just uh, on a couple minutes ago about making the decision to be in a band as opposed to a hired gun. You really, you were taking a risk at that point. Because there's no guarantees with a band. You're putting all your eggs in one basket. But the payout is much bigger if it, if it hits. It's like well, playing the lottery. If you have success, for sure, absolutely. Sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've always said, and I've always been this guy, you know, yeah. I mean, a curse and a blessing all in of itself. It goes both ways. Uh, but with me, when I'm in, I'm all in. And when I believe in something, I mean, it's going to, I mean, I knew the second I joined Tesla, the only thing missing from that band was me. And I knew we were <laughs> going to do exactly what we did. There was no doubt in my mind. So none of it was a surprise. 
None of it. You had the confidence going into it. I, I knew. I knew I was the guy. I seen what I needed to see after checking them out in a club yeah. for two evenings. And when I watched everybody in the band, once I got to Jeff, he held my attention all night. And I yeah. and I flashed back on that. I'm like, this guy's got it. Well, what a unique voice. It sounds like he's been gargling with razor blades for 40 years. You know what I mean? That's so unique. But also to be able to to maintain that kind of vocal expertise 35 years later, that's very impressive. You know, yeah, there was a time where it um, it, it really got pretty weak. Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. where, you know, before, I mean, no drugs or alcohol or a beer backstage and a tussle tour since uh 04 wow wow so that's how except for that time that i showed up at the rhyme and, and, and they were like get this kid out of here <laughs> but I, I still couldn't even have <laughs> your beer that was the drag <laughs> um but yeah you know the, the game changer in all of that yeah i mean i've always said man if you you know if you're not willing to stick your neck out far enough to be chopped off don't bother man and, well, that's, and, a, that's business 101 right there you know, it, it is yeah Jim, great question and observation for sure. I mean, you're, you're putting on, it's a risk. Uh, yeah. A big risk. And I never, I never really thought too much about, you know, um, it's, it's funny that, you know, when we don't have something, we want certain things. There were things I right. wanted to do and couldn't do because I was in a band. You know, you can't develop yourself and do sessions and a lot of things and put yourself in those worlds. All the sessions and the things that I've done over the years have just been from people that have called me. I've never seeked any of it out. I've never Mm. looked for anything. I've managed to do pretty well over the years, you know. um, Oh, yeah. With with some of the different things I've been able to do outside of the group. Uh, But, you know, I mean – you know, if you want to be a session drummer, Rich, you know, you can't, you can't go on the road. Yeah. You got to stay, you got to stay home. I mean, you've been able to do both sides of that fence, but, and some people can manage it and do it. But I mean, you know, but it wasn't something I always wanted to do. Even when I was going back and forth to LA, I did a lot of stuff in LA. Yeah. You know, there was, well, I, I remember club. meeting you at Forks Drum Closet in 09. It was a great, you and I was like, a, I, it could have been 07, but I think it was 09. And you said, you know, I didn't move to Nashville to like, become a session drummer. I moved here just cause I like the city and the lifestyle and I'm here. Was, and yeah, it was for my daughter. Skyler, yeah. yeah. Quite honestly, who's with me now. I've had her here for three months. And, That's awesome. You know, How's she doing? She's doing great. Great. Yeah, nice. she's doing really great. Making a lot of, uh, a lot of progress. But I mean, in the, in the beginning, you know, the, so you start a business, essentially starting a band, taking that risk. Uh, I mean, the business has already been started. You're, you're seeing the, you know, the template up on stage and you decided that this is what I want. You get into it. Uh, are the roles already defined? You know, everybody that's in a partnership in a business has got specific roles. You know, some guy might be the CFO. One guy's a CMO. Who's the CEO? That kind of thing. There's Jim. God, no. We're a young band smoking a lot of pot, drinking. Right. You know, no, that- sa- no business savviness whatsoever. It didn't come till those things got developed and put together as we right. were kind of doing things. And, you know, I'm happy to say that again, that there aren't any drugs, but, you know, unfortunately in the beginning, I mean, everybody smoked pot, you know, I wasn't yeah. a real pot guy, you know, I take a hit and I, uh, I couldn't handle it much. I, I was the one hit man <laughs> and even taking one hit, I just get paranoid. It didn't a cheap work. date, but cheap date. <laughs> yeah, I just get yeah. tired, <laughs> you know, but you know, I got myself into some trouble later and you know, I mean, we hit the road in 87, 91. I mean, I ended up in treatment. I'm 27 years sober. So that's my, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, Amen. So, I mean, I was God bless able, you. yeah, thank you. I was able to kind of, you know, figure all of that out through, you know, some chat. But I mean, you know, entering in contract negotiations with record companies, you hear these stories all the time, how just get assigned and you have no idea what you're signing, you know? Well, you know, what you do is you have a great attorney. It's all yeah. about, you got to have. But even knowing to have a great attorney. Well, we were, is one thing. Uh, you know, we, we were very blessed. I mean, we were managed by Q Prime Management, who still manages yeah. Metallica, Cliff and right. Peter. So they jumped right in. There's a, there's a backstory. I quit the band right before we signed the contract. You don't, I mean, wow. these are stories that a lot of people don't know. And I quit because the manager wanted me to sign uh, a contract that I wouldn't sign uh, because he owned everything. And, and, uh, and I just said, Steve, I says, this has to be redone. And it turned into a, 
them auditioning drummers and me getting kind of out of that scene. And then wow. I see an attorney. I seen an attorney and they're getting ready to, as Tom Zutat came into the picture and I became the problem guy and, um, and they were going to let me go, but they had to go back and do another showcase. And they called me back and I'd seen the attorney and he said, he goes, you got to get your guys in here. And I said, man, I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm going to go do this gig. And, and, you know, lo and behold, man, I talked to everybody. We went back and, you know, they ended up seeing the attorney. We let the manager go and that brought in Q prime because Tom Zutat came back in and he brought Cliff and Peter into the scene and they managed uh, us leopard Doc in uh, Metallica and I mean they had you know a lot of the big bands and yeah. uh, you know so and then they brought in uh, Peter Paterno who's one of the greatest all time most famous attorneys on the planet uh, right yeah so it wasn't all smooth sailing and there was a break it, there no, no matter of fact uh, and then you guys was, got back together there was a half a million dollars in settlement suits that had to be taken care of before Tussle seen any money. Everybody got paid out before yeah. anything happened. Yeah. Um, but it was part of the process. And when that happened, I kind of pulled back. I, I just wanted to play drums. I didn't want to really be involved in any business. I just had enough business in myself to go, no, I can't sign that, you know? Um, so, and I had to walk away and I and walk away from the band when they were going to move forward without me. And they were young, but, and, and, and for, you know, I mean, and I got that. Nobody's going to sacrifice that, you know. But, you know, these are all those learning curves, you know, and I'm just thankful we got through it. I mean, there's so much that we have gotten through over the years, you know, and um, it's been a Did you have your eye on the prize in the long run, or did you just kind of fall in love with the process every day, day in, day out? Day in, day you in. know, um, I knew, again, I had – I mean, I knew we were going to do what we did. And right when we signed the contract, Tom Zutat moved. He signed Motley Crue. He signed Guns N' Roses. I mean, so he moved wow. from Electra over to Geffen. And we were his first signing of Geffen along with Guns N' Roses. Right. And so that was all. And Geffen was, you know, they had Aerosmith, White Snake, all of that big comeback stuff that was happening. And we were part of that whole scene and doing dates. We did the Cotton Bowl with Aerosmith, I remember. Um, Poison. It was what? Um, it was Boston. Late 80s. It was. It was. A, it was. It was a. You know. It, it was great. White Snake was on that bill too, and I was like, man, there's a lot of Geffen acts right here. At the Cotton Ball. I mean, you know, here we were, and you know, three out of the five bands were, you know, were Geffen acts. And Geffen had great ten first ten years, and we were part wow. of the, those Geffen years. You know. And yeah, then in no. recent years, a lot of those package tours were very popular. Again, I remember seeing you at the, um, the you know, the Enormo Dome in Nashville with uh, you guys, Def Leppard, and was there another act? It was maybe about four years Ooh. ago. It was either Styx or R.E.X. Styx. Was yeah. it Styx? Yep. With Todd? Yeah. Classic yeah. rock. You know, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's such a trip, you know. I mean, I love, I love looking back at all this yeah. stuff because I've had an amazing ride because I got to go a, a 10 years ahead of you because I'm 61, Rich. Yeah, no, we're like uh, 10 and a half years apart. You, you know? know, that's yeah. so, so when I was You're listening looking. to MTV and I, and the video for, you know, modern day cowboy and all that stuff was on every day. I was like, like who is this guy? <laughs> and then, you know, we become friends. And then, you know, over the years, you and I are doing clinics together and me, you and Sandy are doing clinics together. And I meet your brother and I meet your family. And it's like, cool. you meet your heroes. It's cool. You know, well, I, you I know. first got introduced to you by a Tama catalog in 1989. Oh, it was like, you were, yeah. you were weightlifting the, the bass drums with the drummer from uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, or was it Pat, Pat Torpoy? Pat, Pat Torpy, God, God rest yeah. his soul. You guys were like, bit, like curling bass drums I, or something. I wasn't. No, that wasn't me in that one. I the one Jim's talking about. It was at the tour bus shot where I'm stepping off the bus. I think so because <laughs> you, it was you. Charlie Benante was in yeah. it. Scott Rockenfield. Yeah. Uh, and I, I that was it in the time of my life where I just started playing drums and I was looking. I wanted to get the next new kit. And my parents were ready to buy one for me. And I wanted a Pearl double bass nine piece, mm. which was never going to happen because they weren't going to buy that for me. And I looked at Tama and everything. I just, I, I looked at those pictures. I kid you not, probably a hundred hours just 
salivating. That is and, so cool. but I mean, that's how I, I got introduced to you. And then the next thing, this is how I'm going to tell a story here was this particular song because of this particular riff. I'm just going to go on record and say Troy Lucetta taught me the sugar boom. <laughs> that riff. Okay. We we're playing pool. Is that like we used to go to this, <laughs> Yeah. We used to play pool in this place off of uh, right by, uh, it was in Dan- Danbury, Connecticut. And on the jukebox, I would play that song till it wore out. That is so cool. You yeah. know, we shot that in Long Beach Arena. I know. Video. It's empty. We shot it during the day. I think we, um, yeah, that was, that was, I remember that. You know, those are a lot of great years. You know, back, I mean, the 80s was, and, and early 90s, all the way up until 95 when we broke up. I mean, those first 10 years were phenomenal because we came right out and we started with David Lee Roth and, on the Eatem and Smile tour. Went out and did that for a few months. Came home, went out with Alice. We went to uh, London on our own. We did two nights at the Marquee, sold out. We did some clubs, and that was great in Europe. Uh, we came back, and then we did 15 months with Def Leppard on the Hysteria Tour. Wow. I mean, that's how, we, that's how we started, and everything was sold out. And we stayed in arenas pretty much the first 10 years. I mean, right before we woke up, we were in theaters on our own. And, you know, but um, it, it, was a, it was a great time for music. Yeah, I mean, it really it was. was. It was a lot of cool stuff happening, you know. And then you really yeah. hockey sticked in '91 with signs right. and the uh, the unplugged stuff. Yes, right? yes, uh, yes. And now you're fast forward 30 years later. I don't know if you know we have a record out called the Five Man London Jam that came out with COVID. Wow! Mm-hmm. Talk to live. us about that. That is live at Abbey Road. Wow, so when did you guys go there? The day before last year, we were playing the Download Festival. Yeah. Which is a big 100,000, you know, one of those big festivals. And uh, we went in the day before. And uh, Universal paid for it. They want us to go in and do something in celebration. We did a half dozen from the five-man acoustic jam, revisited, along with, you know, some of the stuff off the shock record that we did with uh, Phil Collin. Oh, yeah, we got to talk about that. Yeah, uh, you know, and uh, and then we had some new stuff, uh, and it, re- you know, the funny thing is, Rich, we went in. They had five camera shoot uh, in the main room, you know, staircase, the whole Beetle thing, you know, Beautiful. and it was so freaking awesome. There's a live DVD out on it, Blu-ray. Just That's awesome. On. Did you play uh, Kit with uh, with brushes, or did you play oh, like cajones and stuff? I played Kit with sticks, but oh, I just wow. I, you'll see I'm playing really light. I'm not. I'm no. not killing. I'm not killing anything because the of, drums weren't mic'd. They had like yeah, they, yeah, right. They had 20 people in the room, which were just like press people, and uh, we went in. We played through the the the, the recording. I mean, we did one pass through, and we split. There's not one thing that was fixed or touched up on it. We didn't. I nice. never even heard it finished until they sent it to us. You know, it's out, and it came out really good. So thank God it came out good. Beautiful, yeah, raw and real. Yeah, it is. It's it's and it's really good. Jeff sounds great. The band sounds great. Just sitting on bar schools, uh, stools. It, it came out really nice. Real proud of it. Yeah, it's good. That's awesome. And then you had a record that Phil Collin from Def Leppard produced. And am I right in saying he? It, hopefully, it was for this record. He said, um, "I want like soccer moms to be able to to air drum this stuff yeah. or sing the drum parts." That's pretty true. Yeah, yeah. Basically, but yeah, that's exactly what happened. Uh, what happened was. The band was right. While we were on tour, he had a song called Save That Goodness that he wanted us to record. He loved the band, and he was the same guy that came up to us in the middle, probably in the middle of the Sticks thing. I don't know if it was before um, you saw us or after that. Um, he said to the band, hey, you guys can't be looking like the crew, and he got us you know, into good clothes and looking good and looking like rock stars again. And the band looks really good now when we hit stage. And we brought that because of him. And then we did this song called Save That Goodness. He's in the video. You can go back and check that out at some nice. point. That was the first thing we did. And then next thing I know, he wants to, uh, I don't know if it was Brian or him who decided that uh, they, he wanted to do the full, full record, which we got on the phone, we did a conference call and we talked about it and we agreed that we would let him produce the record. 
and do what he wanted. And yeah. that's what we did. So while they were working and writing songs, while we were on the road, he was, there was many trips back and forth. There was a couple drum, just some drum machine ideas. Uh, and I stayed out of that process. Um, and I stayed out of um, listening to things until it was time for me to record. And then I said, what are we doing tomorrow? Because we were going in, me, him, and the engineer, and I didn't know exactly what the process, and that's what he, uh, he gave me the three songs. So I went in an hour before, just did quick cheat sheets on everything, listened through everything, because I, did, I didn't know the songs, and I hadn't played anything at that point. Um, and I didn't, he just said, I just wanted to be able to air drum the record, exactly what you just said. Uh, yeah. He said, I just, and uh, in other words, let's not get fancy, you know. <laughs> and I said, hey, no problem, you know. Uh, and we worked through those parts together. We were doing three, three songs a day. And I think, you know, four days later, we had the drums done, you know, and that was fine. It was a process of just him and I working through the, the whatever we wanted to do. Uh, and if he had ideas, hey, how about blue, blue, blah, blah, blue, 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 blah. Oh, okay, like this, blue, blue, blah, blah, blue, blue. That's it, you know. Boom. My Sharona, go. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Whatever it was, you know, but um, it's actually uh, a really good record. There's a lot of really good stuff on there. You know, we had some of the Tesla haters come out because the first song that came out was a song called Shock, which is all drum machine. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, and I, I kind of laugh because uh, the whole Tesla catalog, Jim, you might be familiar with this. All the records say, no machines. Right. You know, Queen's thing was no synthesizers, right? So Tesla, we were, you know, byproduct of what we love listening, you know, later. And yeah. we were a band, you know, where there was no machine. Everything we did was live. We never had samples, you know, everything. No samples, no nothing. It was, it, it's a rock and roll band. That's what we were, and that's what we were doing. Yeah. So now Shock comes out, and the first song, Shock, which is the name of the song, we comes out as drum machine, so the haters came out right away on that thing. Uh, yeah. But, you know, Classic Rock Magazine, Europe, they named, named it doing one of the greatest Tesla records ever. Wow. Uh, and we charted with the record. You can't, you can't, you can't. 21 uh, on Billboard charts, Rich. I mean, for a record, for a band like us, that was, we, we were 23 the first week, 21, and then boom, it was gone. But, you know. Ep got that's epic. And, and, and number two on the rock charts. So, and if you I have mean, haters, you're doing something right. So that is a exactly. good, right? You know, I, I loved it because I'm like, man, nobody, I mean, we've got a lot of good press over the years, you know. I mean, people have always been, you know, very kind to the band, you know. So I was like, cool, we got some haters out there. Shit's happening, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. So, yeah, I was scanning the whole, dis you know, your whole discography. And it was just like, you know, trying to just get a taste of all the eras, you know. There's, there's yeah, there's there's a lot of music and uh, it's, it's been great. You know? How do you decide what to put on the, what is your, what are your shows? 90 minutes or are they two hours? No, we do a 90. We used to do two and a half hours uh, for a while there. But when we got back into, you know, coming back out in a more, uh, uh, I guess it would be headlining live, live nation. Gotcha. Right. When we got back on live nations radar with leopard, and then we start doing all the Live Nation dates again. We're down to, you know, just a real solid, you know, 90 minutes. And, you know, the set list, it could change up. Yo, you got all the staples. I don't know. How is it for now being showed? Do you guys have to keep all the staples and change it up? Or can you get yeah. more flexibility? We do like 24 songs. And right now he's got, right now he's got 24 number ones. So that's, that's like really difficult to like narrow it down. So if a couple of them we leave out and then, you know, sometimes like halfway through the tour, we'll be like, you know, why aren't we doing that song that was your first number one? But for right. most, for the most part, it's, you know, leave them wanting more 24 songs, you know? Yeah. You guys had, you've had such an amazing career and you know, it's great because when I moved here, Rich, I didn't know anything about, anything other than Keith Urban. I mean, right. Sean Paddock, God bless him, I met him at NAMM, and he invited me out. They did a Crossroads with Steve Miller. I didn't even know who Kenny Chesney was. Right. I didn't know who Jason Aldean was. I didn't know any, you know, I, didn't, I, I was clueless to this whole scene, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and meeting you, you know, has been wonderful. I mean, you know, I mean, we, we hit it right off, and, you know, and thank you for the all the amazing years that you invited me to be, just hang out and be coffee guy. At, oh, you were my first teacher at the at the drummers weekend, and the kids loved you. And you brought Mark Benea and your whole band in there, and the kids got all this massive bang for their buck. And you know, you and I, it's no secret we love coffee. So I remember going to PAS with you, maybe like, God, it it could be 
could be like seven or eight years ago now, but there's pictures of you and I just holding coffee with our really tight, skinny jeans on and just like, yeah, just like, just energy, man. That was a great, we got to share the flight and the room and the hotel and just that spend was a fun. weekend together. I had, you know, I don't know if you know this or remember, I should say, I didn't have a website. And I didn't have no Facebook. I did nothing. And you said to me, I don't know if you remember this. But you, <laughs> you go, you go, hey, Troy, you go, you're doing all this cool stuff and nobody knows about it, you know? Uh, and I go, yeah, I know. You know <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of how I like, I like it. it. <laughs> you know? But you're like, hey, man, you know, all your companies and, you know, you gave, you gave me the rap, man. And, and I'm, I'm going today with all that stuff. I've made a lot of progress. I had to find my way around it because I was the guy that never wanted to do interviews. I was always, you know, uh, I'm not quite as humble as I was. Thanks to you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I've learned, you know, but I mean, I think there's, and it's, and it's not false humility. It really isn't. I just never believed anything about it. No, it, it, and that, because I know who the great guys are. And I never felt like I was one of those guys, you know, but you know, but you again, are, I, you are. I mean, you know, to be I, a, I, yeah. I realized that I've done really, really well. And, uh, and I realized how blessed I am for sure. You know, and, uh, you know, I mean, I, I was, uh, I get up, I go to bed at midnight. I'm up at 5 a.m. I mean, when Tesla broke up, I had a roofing company, Rich. I had 10 employees, man. I mean, yeah. I was, I was committed to staying home for four years, which I did. That's interesting. Wow. While my, while my You're son getting was getting in the trains. Oh, man. I, yeah, man. I, I mean, I would do roof houses by myself. You now, know, five I, hours uh, of sleep for guys our age, you know, I, they, I mean, that's cool, but not every day. Like, sometimes, like, I got to get some eight hours here and there. I can't, I can't get, I wish I could. I, yeah. I, 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 I'm not wired that way, but I, you know, I got up, you know, I, I spent a little time in my, you know, my spiritual stuff kind of hanging let's, out. Let's chase this rabbit hole here for a second. This he roofing company. It. That's interesting. Jim wants That's to really talk about roofing. When did, when, when, did, <laughs> when did the roofing company happen? When was it? What um, time frame was that? That was Tesla broke up in 96. 96. Uh, you come off from this massive rock band. You're like, I'm going to, I want to get up on roofs. Well, I had done some roofing. So what you don't yeah. know, check this out. Bearsville studios, first Tesla album. I put in a bid for a job that I got to roof a house while I recorded the first Tesla record in Bearsville studios, Woodstock, New York. Yeah. Okay. I made a thousand bucks. I nailed out 3,200 square feet by myself <laughs> of roofing and uh, came home with a thousand dollars because I needed the money. That exercise uh, is good for your tan. Yeah. You know what? And, and it was a hell of a time to do it because I, I'd have to get off the roof from 11 to about four in the afternoon because I'd have to start early because the freaking night got hot. Material. But yeah, those yeah. asphalt shingles, I'd just scar them. But, you know, I'm no stranger to work, man. I've always no. worked uh, and, and the roof and things. So I went back to it. Uh, when Tesla broke up in 96, I didn't want to think about the transition. And basically yeah. what happened, we're, now we're coming back to the Kenny Aronoff thing. And I'm going to go ahead and share it since we're on that subject. Because 96, I came home. First thing I thought about is I got to find a gig. All right. So that's where my head was at before I did the roofing thing. Uh, and my son was going into high school. So my thing is like, I got to find a tour. So I got called in. I did a session on a record with this uh this guy and Bob Johnston was a producer from um, you know, um, Bob, um, you know that famous guy that uh, uh, <laughs> Bob I, I Rock. No, no, no. We're talking um, uh, Rolling Stones. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Uh, like a, like a Rolling Stone. Yeah, Bob Dylan. Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. See what Thank happens? You. That's why I don't do drugs yeah. anymore, Rich, okay? Well, yeah. this, is, this is the residual effect of drug use. <laughs> yes, it, it's what, hey, every now and then there's a freaking, you know, Ginkgo circuit. Balboa. Take some but, uh, Ginkgo Balboa. <laughs> yeah, so at any rate, I go in the studio. I'm in the studio with Vernon Black and uh, the guitar uh, bass player, uh, Roly Sally from Chris Isaac, and we were backing up an artist, and we did this EP, and I was like, in the studio, I got a phone call to go audition for John Mellicat. Wow. And what, so what year was this? 96. Oh, nice. Yeah, early 96. And Mellencamp, he's a, he's a driver, man. He's 16. So perfectionist. I'm going to go ahead and share the story since we're here. I'm like, first of all, I'm like, I don't know how they got my number, but I do know how they got my number. Um, Ringo's Tech. Um, Jeff Shonis? Jeff. I came through Jeff. Yeah. I think I got a phone call from Jeff Shonis, and um, 
at any rate, told me about the audition. It was all bought and paid for. Flew me to Bloomington, the whole deal. 16 drummers. They had Saturday. I was on Sunday. Me, I get off in LA, LAX, because I flew from San Francisco. They stopped there, but I didn't have to deboard the plane to get on another flight, but they were letting a few people on, like Myron Grumbacher and Pat Torpy. Yeah. So we jump, yeah, we jump on the plane. We fly to Bloomington together. We jump in a limo, go to our hotel. Uh, I'm the first guy at noon on Sunday. Pat was one and uh, Myron two. Uh, and the real quick short story to this is um, when I got there, they had already had eight guys the day before on the hour starting at noon. And I looked down the hallway they in, and invited me into this other building. And I could see the guys were just hunched over the table and they looked like they were just beat up to hell. And it was Mike, the guitar player. Uh, Mike Wanchik, bass, right? Bass player. And just the two guitar players and bass player. Yeah. And, and um john and uh so john so anyway i i just they asked i just said no nah, i'm gonna go in the rehearsal room they had a little barn and i walked in there and i just i had a pedal i think i brought with me in my stool because i had to sit real low and I, I, I if i'm sitting too high i couldn't be comfortable so that's all i brought with me was a pedal and a stool so i went in there and i just adjusted this little kit and here comes the guys they walk in and they just looked at me, and it was pretty cold, uh, quiet. They were just kind of waking up. Maybe they had some coffee in them. And uh, Chris sat to my – I mean, the bass player, I forgot his name. It could have been Toby, there. maybe? It was Toby, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. He was right on my left on my hi-hat, sitting right next – my hi-hat's right here. Yeah. And he's yeah. right here. And the two guys stood right over me, and they go, we got to wait for John. He's doing a phone interview. And I said, okay. Um and they're waiting for a second. Nobody's saying that. They're just kind of tweaking, and I'm just sitting there. And then they go, we got to get started, you know. And I said, okay, they had a camera. And I was like, okay, sure, whatever. You know, so like, what do you want to do? And I, I did paper and fire. So I start. Right. You know the tune, right? So I'm in, man. I start the track, man. And, and now Toby, who was just like, he's starting to get a groove on. He's you know, he started to get into it. <laughs> and the guys are standing over me and we play, and I play just like Kenny. I, I mean, I would have gave myself a high nineties on that. I mean, I really did my homework, went in prepared. High nineties. You got an A. Did, and then we did check it out. Check it out. You know, Love that, it. so, and I, and I, hundred a plus on that when I knew and I, I was in my zone. It didn't matter. I, I was there for me at that point. Um, because I was so nervous. I had never done anything like that before, but anyway, we got done okay. and then we did some original jam and, uh, they stopped me and they, and Mike, the guitar player, he goes, so what's Tesla doing? I go, nothing. Tesla's broken up. And he goes, he goes, wow. And I swear the next thing out of his mouth, Rich, he goes, could you join the band? And I was like, join the band? What are you talking about? I thought you guys were just looking for someone to tour. No, we don't tour. You don't tour. I'm freaking way confused now. I'm looking at him like, Mike, what are you talking about? He goes, <laughs> he goes John had a heart attack. He's not touring. But we're looking for someone to join the band, you know. Gosh. And uh, I said, wow, that's interesting. I have a family back home. I live in California, kids and the whole bit. I says, Probably doesn't make any sense, but uh, I plan, plus you got a, you had all these drummers yesterday. You got another eight great drummers today coming in, and he goes, "I'm going to tell you." He goes, he just shook his head. He goes, "These guys that come in, he goes, nobody knows the songs." Oh my God! He told me that, and How I knew who do some that? of the, I, I knew who some of the guys were on that, and then Pat was. They wanted me to stay, meet John, hang out. Yeah, and I wasn't comfortable with that. Obviously, I go, Pat. No, I got the guys. The guy next guys, I, they're my friends. They're coming in next, and but they want, and I go, you know, thank you, man. But I knew that was for me, not for them. Yeah, that audition was, because I didn't believe, first of all, anything about how I got there, you know, and, and, and I and then it worked out. I just was Kenny for a minute, and I went back to the hotel, and right after that, I called Kenny. You know, and uh, I told him, he goes, "Hey, how's freaking California?" <laughs> I'm like, "I'm in Bloomington." <laughs> You're in Bloomington. What are you doing in Bloomington? Why would I be here, Kenny? I'm freaking auditioning for Melanie Yeah, He didn't what? know about this? Well, apparently, he came right down to the hotel, and he had a son with him, and we talked about it, and he shared some information. And uh, two years later, I was having dinner with him at NAM, and that's when I found because I didn't know what happened, exactly what happened. And I was, it was me and Simon Phillips and him were having dinner at a Tama thing. 
after. And I said, Kenny, yes, I got to ask you a question. I says, is that how you learned you were out of the band? He goes, yeah. I go, dude, I'm so sorry. I go, I can't believe that I thought, see, I thought he was done way out of the band and they were auditioning drummers and shit. I, yeah. I want a shot at it. What? I mean, it was innocent on my part or stupidity on my part. 96. That was 24 years ago. That's exactly. crazy. Which was the best thing that ever happened to Kenny Enoff. I mean, look at him now. I mean, you know. But well, I, I mean, think but, I think yeah. he did seven, fourteen or seventeen years of the band, something like that. So, um, you know, hurts so good. I think it was like eighty one or eighty two, right? I so I thought, was, I thought it was twenty years. So yeah, he, yeah. wow. But, I saw but, him back up yeah, Michelle Branch. So, yeah, I mean, so back. So think about this, Rich. Yeah. He goes. So he's out with. This is the story. I remember just like yesterday. <laughs> he goes, he goes, Trey goes, look, he goes here. Kenny, uh, um, John calls me, wants me to do this thing for Walmart. And I'm out with Seeger. He goes, I can't do it. He goes, I'm out with Seeger. And John's like, fine. I'll, sure. Fine. Then I'll find somebody else thinking I'll find somebody else for that. But that's the backstory. And knowing yeah. how, you know, more to the story that I probably, should, you know, yeah. We'll talk about no, that, I, I, but, that's interesting. Yeah. But, I, uh, I mean, I don't know how, you know, Pat and I, we never really discussed his audition. I never told them any of this, when, but what I'm sharing here, I never shared it. Wow. Uh, You're however, hearing it first on the right. Rich Redmond show. It's in my book. Got, well, you know, well, you know, it's funny. I saw him two years ago at the Greek theater because um, Mellencamp came through. And so I went to go because I'm chummy with, you know, Dane Clark, the current drummer. And Kenny was there and he said, Rich, I haven't seen the band since I left. Wow. So it was interesting to see Dane and Kenny and, you know, right there at the, at the Greek theater. It was interesting. Here's the thing about Kenny. Like I said, back in Vegas, when we lived there, we saw him play with Michelle Branch at the Hard Rock, I want to say. Hard Rock Live. And, uh, yeah. yeah, it was you know, one, of that big, one of those big venues we had backstage and everything, got the meter or whatever. But uh, when he comes walking out, I think more people knew who he was than knew who she was. Like, people actually gave him a standing ovation, which, I, pretty, which was mind-blowing to me. It is. Pretty, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I I remember some friend of mine wanted to go, was studying with Kenny and wanted to go um, see him with Joe Cocker. And he went to go to Will Call to like get his tickets. And the lady at the ticket booth was like, who is this Kenny guy? Everybody knows this guy. This is the lady at the at the Joe Cocker's Will Call booth. I love Hilarious. It. He definitely, he definitely left a mark, man, just like yourself. And you know what? I feel like you're continuing to do that, Troy. Um, you know, I have one more question because I want to ask you about Troy Shows Up. But Jim has yeah. this great part of the show that we like no, to call the- Oh, now it's great. In the beginning, oh, you didn't think it was so great. Well, it's <laughs> taken 80 episodes, so here we go. <laughs> All right. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. The random question of the day slash show for you, Troy. Which celebrity do you think is the most down to earth- that he's met or just that he hears about in life? Well, you know, impression-wise. Could be anything. Well, I mean, there's celebrities. And I guess we're going for... Hmm. Uh, Tommy Shaw. Who's that? Tommy Shaw. Ah. ah. He lives in Nashville now, doesn't he? The... Uh, you know, the thing about Tommy, I mean, let's think about that man for a minute. Okay. Huge. I mean, I grew up listening to that music and, oh. um, and being on the road with him and just being in the presence of all these other tours that we've done. And we've done a lot of tours. When, when Sticks, I mean, that was, that was the funnest tour. Yeah. That we, I mean, it was phenomenal with those guys out there. And, you know, the whole backstory to Todd Zuckerman. I mean, Todd was out with his band, uh, the Falling Luandas, if that's how you say it. Luandas. Uh, yeah. He had a band. And uh, I'm, I'm, Todd and I, so I walked into the China Club in Chicago and he was playing. And I stand on the side of the stage and he he seen me. And this was 30 years ago, whatever yeah. it was. And he called me out and we transitioned and, you know, I started playing and just seamlessly, we just, we became friends. I 
helped him pack his drums that night. And, and I used to go to his house and I always told him, I said, Todd, so you, you can't play that great and not get picked up. You will be found out. And sure enough, the rest is history. But, you know, those are the kinds of cool stories and the things that happen, you know, that we get to see and that we get to be a part of, you know, you know, but uh, thinking about the, and then being out with, you know, Tommy and the, the sticks band and, seeing Todd play that music every night and it just, you know, just, I got so many amazing memories, but yeah. I, I have to say that Tommy, what a perfect gentleman. That's you know. always great to hear. Always it's nice when you meet, when you meet the nice ones. I mean, I remember, you know, a lot of the people I met was in Vegas when I did radio out there. I remember the ones that weren't and right. they didn't have any license to be. That was the funny thing. The ones that well, are complete bags. Yeah, that would have been really, you know, yeah. thank you for not asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who are the bad ones? Because that's probably a longer list. It, you know, yeah, but, it, it, you know, it's like, get over yourself, you know. Uh, one of them, I'll say it, one of them was Robin Leach. Remember him? Oh, yeah. Lifestyles of the rich and famous, that guy. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Dude, it's 2002. All right. You were relevant in 1987. Get over yourself. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's that fight for relevancy. Is just, it just consumes us, um, Troy? What is this the, now? You you know you've been speaking to high school groups and encouraging a future generation of kids, and you're calling it Troy shows up. Tell us about that, man. Um, it was an accident. Everything I do <laughs> is an accident. Uh, it's a byproduct of um, many things. One being sober. Uh, I had a friend who would ask me to speak to a middle school in Derby, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And um, Brady Ayers, he's with his uh, company, Justin's. They do the graduating rings and such. And um, I said, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, drugs. And I said, drugs. I said, well, I know a little bit about that. I've been sober at that time, 25 years. I said, sure. I said, I would. And, um, you know, I didn't hear a lot about it for a while. And then we had lunch about six months later. I was coming back through Kansas. And he, and he called me out and he says, hey, man, I want you to do it. I think it was in August at the time and uh, two years ago. And, I, I, you know, I was home. I had a month off. And I'll be honest, Rich, I mean, you know me. Uh, you know me really, really well, especially sure. with the clinics that we've done. And, you know, I mean, every, my whole life, everything scares me. That's just me. But I say yes to everything uh, because... So things scare you, but you show up anyways. And Yeah. And if you go to TroyDeCetta.net, you'll see just show up. And that, you know, that was my whole motto in life. Just show up, you know, things happen, you know, kind of thing. And uh, so as it would turn out, um, I said I would do it. And I was home for a month and I, had, he, he's, I said, what do you want? He goes, 20 minutes of playing, 20 minutes of presentation, 20 minutes of question and answer. So... Nice. I had a friend of mine, Gusty, we were in Colorado the week before, right before I'm getting ready to do this. And mind you, Rich, coming up to this, I'd put some notes and some things together and I, I wasn't sure what it was going to be, man. And, and I was losing some sleep and I'm like, what did I sign up for? And blah, blah, you know, <laughs> so my, you know scratching and itching and, you know, and uh, so my buddy Gusty says, uh, he says, hey, man, are you going to document this thing? And this was a week before I'm out and he was in Colorado, we were playing. And I said, Mom, no, I don't have any plans. He goes, I'm bringing my stuff and my gear. So he showed up. I showed up. We met at the school. Um, I did my presentation. I documented all of it. Nice. Uh, I went on to do another one in Chicago, uh, outside of Chicago. And then I did two here at uh, Nashville. I did uh, middle school, high school at Stratford, East Nashville at uh, Stratford. Nice. Um, yeah. And so I've only done like, uh, you know, four presentations uh, enough to find out. And I had more book for this year, but everything got put on hold, obviously. And I have these other ones. So everything on TroyShowsUp.com, it came TroyShowsUp.com because Just Show Up was taken. And I thought, well, how about Troy Shows Up? You know, just for a joke. And uh, it's so it's something I look forward to doing more. I've been talking and doing some um, Zooms at treatment centers and starting to speak to people. And basically Wonderful. what it is is um, it's um, – I'm the good example of the bad example is, is my thing based on the fact of the bad choices and people pleasing and how we get into trouble. So I've kind of transitioned some of the drug stuff because there's so much going on with 
with um, you know social media suicide and all that stuff that the real thing that's going on with these kids and uh, I've got a real strong passion for it and that's why I can do it and I can talk about it and I can talk about the bad choices and the people pleasing and the things that I did to try to fit in growing up uh, and it you know eventually got me to treatment so that's great that's that's the story behind it's an amazing uh, story to share man and I'm sure if you've done it four times you know you've been honing in on your message and now you could probably do it virtually you know you could have some pre-recorded versions of yours playing and then then do your presentation in front of a green screen or in your studio and then do 20 minutes of questions and there you go well thank you rich uh a lot of these things i'm doing if i mean quite honestly and i can't give you uh enough attention in this area because if you go to troyshowsup.com i have a list of mentors and i, I don't know if you know but you're on there and, I made the uh, list. This is nuts. Yes. Uh, and there's, some, <laughs> there's some heavy hitters up there too, but you deserve that. Uh, Cause I've watched you and I've been so inspired. I mean, I do follow you and pay attention to what's going on. Uh. And, uh, and I'm like, man, when I grew up someday, I want to be rich Redmond, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and I, mean that, I mean that, with all, I mean that with all sincerity uh. Uh, because I've, it's been that much of an inspiration to me to see me from where I came from and fr- afraid to speak in front of anybody. This is not who I am, but I'm doing it. You know, I'm getting, but out you got the gift of gab, man. I mean, you that's, do I'm, I'm going to tell you that you, you need your, like your own podcast. Well, you got, you got stories. Thank you. I, 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 I don't know exactly what I'm doing. I will tell you, Rich, since I've been home on this COVID thing, I've, I've got my book done pretty much a full, you know, I'm 82,000 words into it. I've went a book. Place. Is it like a, a memoir, like a yes. life, life story? It is. There you go. My autobiography. And, um, uh, cause I was just, I just read this one that Robin Flans did for Jeff Picaro. I didn't even know that was out. Yeah, it's out. So Robin Flans, the iconic photographer that like was best friends with Jeff. So she did that and she probably got a bunch of pictures of you in, in the heyday. And, um, you know, Liberty's got his book out too. And these, these are both from Hudson, you know, which I got to get, uh, I get, you know, there's another guy, Liberty. We go, we go way back too, and had some wonderful stories back then. And to see so, him at your, your event was fantastic. When's this book coming out, man? Uh, it'll be out early, early next year because our bass player, Brian has one coming out in uh, November. At the wow. end of November. And uh, so I, yeah, this, and I'm just putting all the pictures together and I was looking through Joe Fatale's book and uh, getting some ideas. Yes. And I, I got to go pick Libras. I, uh, did Liberty do, uh, I actually want to read the book and, and see the pictures and, yes. you know, so I, actually, I don't know if he has an ebook yet. Um, yeah. I think it's still hardcover. They maybe just released it on softcover, but he treated himself to a nice hardcover, which is, you know, it's nice one. It's more uh, attractive on a coffee table, you know? Yeah. And, I, and, I, def- and I, I want to pick it up and I want to bend his ear and your ear and different people. And, you yeah. know, um, but it'll come out, um, you know, when I'm, when it's ready, you yeah, know, sure. I'm not yeah. in a hurry, but, and I've also got a, a free download for the kids that I have for the school, which is a 30 to 40 page, easy read, you know, what to do and not to do in terms of, you know, being inspired through my story and give the kids a free download wow. along wow. with uh, a little bit bigger version. So I'll have that for, you know, a few bucks too. I love it. You've been busy, man. Wow. I have, you know, I have, I got my studio working, I'm recording and, uh, I'm working on things and I'm, I'm staying inspired and, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm still going after it, you know, and I just talked to Mark Benita. He just called me and told me the Keith Emerson thing we did. Uh, we did a tribute to Keith you yes. know, at the El Rey theater after he passed and, um, that's coming out. Um, and on I think March 11th would, be uh, the anniversary of his death, which is unfortunate. Wow. His birthday is the March, uh, November second. I need to yeah. talk to Mark. He would be a great guest because he's got such an interesting story as a as a sideman guitar player, as a leader, as someone who can handle fusion and neoclassical music, but then somebody who can. Uh, didn't he play with uh, Cheryl Crow in the early days? Yeah, he was in the Toy Toy Matinee. Yeah, that's right. Klaus Panos was the drummer, and I was around for all that. I was following those guys around, and Kevin Gilbert, and you know, wow. recorded the first album with Kevin Gilbert at Patrick Leonard Studio in Los Angeles. And yes, that was Mark's first album that we did, uh, and you know, that's a thirty-year relationship. I'm on his new record, myself and Joe Travers and uh, Bissonette's on it. Wow, so we shared that. Uh, that just come out, and uh, you know, I, I still do all right. You know, I mean, I'm. 
not out on a ton of records, but you know, I'm on some real meaningful stuff. And as you know, the Emerson thing was the most meaningful thing I've ever done. The three fates project with Keith. That was, you know, I, I still can't even believe I did it to this day. It blows my mind. And it's just wow. such a sad story. And I, and rich, I've never posted anything only because it's, it was just too tragic for me to, I've never been able to share my story with Keith. Um, mm. You know, as far as, I've never done any social sharing on it. Yeah. But at um, any rate, um, hopefully uh, the concert we did will get picked up by an access or a pay-per-view. It's a beautiful tribute. A lot of people, wonderful things. But beautiful. Um, yeah. A lot, beautiful, lot man. Of stuff, man. Well, and so the, the website is net. Correct. Yeah, somebody and, stole my .com. And uh, somebody stole your .com? It had it. They'd say it's me. It's not. It's a bunch of bullshit. It's yeah, something. yeah. I, I didn't want to deal with the legal stuff. I just wanted to try the kind of dot. No, it's hey dot net's fine. It's when you start getting into dot org and stuff, it starts getting weird. Um, but <laughs> a lot of this stuff is can be on is on the website. We're overdue for a visit, but man, I just wanted to publicly thank you for all the years of inspiration. It's so cool to have you as a friend and in uh, Nashville and just be a part of your orbit in your cosmos, man. Well, that's right, right back at you, and congratulations with your new beautiful. Uh, Girl. Uh, Girlfriend, Kara, I've, the fashion designer. It's nice to. It's nice to be loved, isn't it? And to have someone to love. It's a. I think that's Absolutely. what we're supposed to do. Absolutely, it's part of the plan, and I'm thankful that you get a share in that. Thank you, my friend. Well, it is so good to see you, and Jim. Thank you so much for everything you do, buddy. Absolutely, buddy. Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. And for everybody that's listening and watching, man, did Jim and I appreciate it, man. Um, wow! If you love this, subscribe share, rate, and review. It's so easy. It takes 30 seconds. And when you do that, people can find our podcast easier. So tell a friend, keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll see you next time. This has been the Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com.